So, many of these stories start with a cliché. Something like this. I came home from work, and there was a strange car parked in the driveway. Well, damn, this actually happens a lot. And my story has some of that, but it's a little different. What's different about me is that Chrissy loves me and will do whatever it takes to protect me no matter what. Maybe I should start from the beginning. Well, at least not since recently. My name is Tim Matthews. I work in the IT department for a mid-size company in the Midwest. My height is about 178 centimeters, and I weigh 82 kilograms. I have dark brown hair and blue eyes. I am in good physical shape and remain so thanks to regular training and jogging. According to all my friends, I should drown in the attention of women, but I rarely go on dates. It's not that I'm not interested in women or that they aren't interested in me. It's just that I have to be very careful. The first time I was lucky, and although there were suspicions, everything was attributed to a series of coincidences. So I wasn't charged with anything, but I'm sure the police are still watching me now, almost five years later. Mostly because what happened was so damn weird and because they still don't believe it. A couple of weeks ago, I was replacing a monitor in the office on the fifth floor of our building. I tested the old monitor and it seemed to work fine. The screen was clear, graphics were displayed beautifully, and text was easy to read. I found absolutely nothing wrong with the monitor, so I ran it through a troubleshooting program to check color depth, screen position, and everything else I could think of. In the end, I marked the monitor as A-OK -okay and replaced it anyway, with an almost exact copy of the same model. A current user of this workplace raided me while I was working. OK, you know that my monitor is fine. Why did you change it at all? If you were just going to change it, why not just unplug it, plug in a replacement, and then go on your way? You could be out of here in five minutes, she told me. Listen, Miss U. I paused while I searched for my ticket to find her name. This is Miss, she said. I mean, if you don't look at me, you might miss something that could be really good. And the last name is Henderson. The first name you should use is Elaine. Put it all together, and you get Elaine Marie Henderson. For my friends, Elaine, for you, Laney. I felt like I had just been treated to her version of a James Bond line. Well, Laney, my ticket says that you asked for a monitor change because you were having problems with your monitor. I checked it here to see if it was okay and found nothing. But the problem may be situational, which means you have to do certain things to make it happen or it could simply be something that happens at a certain time. This way I don't have to drag it to the IT department and test it. I can just mark it as usable and put it on the shelf when I get there. Again, I'm not trying to guess what you need. If you need a different monitor, I'll give you one. I don't comment on how you make spreadsheets or what you do there, so please be polite and respectful of how I do my job. I'm just trying to help you and give you the tools to do your job. At the end of the day, we all have to be one team. If you ask for a new monitor and I have one, it's yours. Plain and simple. Please have a nice day. Wow, that makes a hell of a lot of sense, she said. Maybe what they said about the IT department isn't entirely true. But what if I already know that there is nothing wrong with my monitor? What if this was all part of a dastardly plot to drag you here so I could ask you a question? I think it must be a damn big deal for you to go through all this trouble and risk, I said. So what is the question? I turned and looked at her for the first time and almost fell. She was tall and slender but curved, where you want your woman to be curved. She had a mane of wild red curls that flowed over her shoulders like a waterfall cascading over a cliff. Her luscious lips were stretched into a welcoming smile, and when she took off the square-framed glasses that office types had been all the rage of late, I nearly fell into her sea-green eyes. It all looked like she had been rehearsing for days. She took off her glasses and shook her head, causing all her hair to become disheveled. It looked like an advertisement for a damn shampoo. She even put one of the temples of her glasses in her mouth and bit down on it lightly, so I could see how white her teeth were. I expected her next move to be a move in which she would open her blouse, unbutton a few buttons, and then slide toward me across the long conference table, 
like in Van Halen's 80s Hot for Teacher video. I was ready for David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen to burst into the room. Dave looked like a game show host on cocaine, and Eddie played one crazy riff after another from a hidden marshal on a guitar that looked like it was taken from a landfill and assembled from spit, Elmer's glue, and duct tape. In the dim depths of my mind, I heard music and could not help but think, everything worked out for me, everything worked out, everything worked out. I fell in love with Lainey. So, that's where I left off. Oh yes, she was about to ask me the big question. If I get disconnected like that again, let me know. Why don't you want to go on a date with me? She asked. It seemed to me that all the air in the room had simply evaporated. I tried to open my lungs and draw in oxygen, but it just wouldn't come into me. I couldn't let him back out either. I'm not dating, I managed to squeeze out. Why, she asked, pouting her perfect lips. It just doesn't work out, it never has. And I don't think it will ever work out. I grabbed my things and headed to her door. The booth wasn't that big, but she covered the distance very quickly and slammed the door, blocking my exit. I think we would be suitable for each other. I did my homework. We're both divorced. In fact, we got divorced for the same reason. We both had partners who weren't worthy of us and cheated on us. We're both into cars and we're both cute. She paused and looked at me again. At least you're cute. I'm not too confident in myself. As she uttered the last phrase, she ran her fingers over her body, from her slender hips to her small but perfectly proportioned breasts. It was like a stripper doing her act with her clothes on. This woman should never be allowed to watch MTV or adult movies. Am I pretty, Tim? All I could do was nod my head up and down. Well, let's talk about this some more. How about tomorrow at lunch in the cafeteria? You should have lunch sometime. When do you eat, Tim? She asked. It took me a few seconds, which seemed more like days, to answer. At 12.45. See you then, she smiled. When I returned to the IT office, most of the men and women were busy, but I saw them all looking at me as I carried the monitor and placed it on the shelf. I looked at the board of available tickets and was about to grab one and head back when one of my best friends, Josh Thomas, grabbed my arm. Well... What do you think? He asked excitedly. What am I thinking about? I asked, looking confused. I noticed that all eyes in the IT office, including my longtime friend and supervisor, Emma Smith, were on me. I went upstairs and tested the monitor and it was fine, but I swapped it anyway and then came back. If you asked me if I thought there was anything wrong with this monitor, I would probably say no, but you know how it goes. Anyway, I'm going to fill another ticket. He looked at me as if I had just thrown away a winning lottery ticket. He then looked around the room and everyone else was just as incredulous. He threw his hands up as if he was beside himself with rage. Emma ran across the floor towards me and stopped me from leaving. Tim, was anyone in the upstairs booth when you changed the monitor? She asked. I tilted my head to the side as if I couldn't remember or wasn't thinking about it. Then I opened my mouth to speak, but quickly closed it again. I noticed that everyone in the fucking office was waiting for me to say, so I wanted to drag it out as long as possible. Yes, there was some woman there. I said it so quietly and so quickly that no one could understand what I said. Then I reached for the doorknob. Emma smacked my hand away from the handle. Okay, we know that you know that we set you up, and we want to know what happened, Emma hissed. Don't be mad. We all love you and think you're a great guy who works too hard, and we just want you to be happy. Elaine has been asking about you since she started working here six weeks ago. You have a lot in common. You both work on cars, and she is very beautiful. She went through a divorce, just like you. You should at least try. I know she asked you out tonight, so are you coming? Well, I guess your plan didn't work, I said. She didn't ask me out on a date tonight. There were a lot of gasps and exclamations when I said this. I even heard someone say, what a bitch. We'll have lunch tomorrow, I smiled. And everyone in the room started laughing and screaming and cheering, as if they had just found that winning lottery ticket I had thrown away and cashed it in. Lunch the next day was modest and restrained. We sat in the cafeteria together, in a back booth, in a corner, 
In the dark, we talked and ate food until we had to go back to work. Almost immediately, I realized that something was happening between us. It was as if we were two halves of a coin that were separated and became whole when they came together. The first time she took my hand, I just wanted to scream, Wonder Twin Powers, activate. This feeling was so strong. I could tell she felt it too, that lunch led to others. Then several movies, dinners, and then suddenly we became a couple. We hadn't seen each other at home yet, hadn't even kissed, let alone had sex. But everyone knew that we belonged to each other, just like at school. It was almost as if we were dating. She was ready for the next step, but I wasn't sure I was. That is, I liked her very much. Perhaps I even knew that I loved her, as much as you can love someone with whom you have not engaged in horizontal movement. But after the divorce, I dated several women, and Chrissy didn't like any of them. I could tell that Lainey really liked me, too, because she always went out of her way to touch me. She also made it clear to all the guys who tried to flirt with her that she was interested in someone else. She is a very beautiful woman, but it seemed that she wanted me. And it wasn't just nonsense, we had a lot in common. Her ex was a lazy bastard who stayed home and supposedly took care of their house while she worked. In fact, he took care of their neighbor's wives. They had a messy divorce that left her supporting him for two years or until he found a job and could take care of himself. The bastard lasted all of two years and then got a job where he made more money than her. Another thing is the car. Very often, friends who want to interest a guy in a woman tell him that she is interested in the same things that he is, so they seem to have something in common. For example, if a guy likes football, they tell him, oh, she loves football, although in fact, she cannot distinguish football from hockey. She usually shows up at his house wearing a baseball jersey and holding a hockey stick, ready to show off her amazing knowledge of the NFL. But, oh well, if a woman is sexy enough, we'll put up with it. Three years later, you're married, and she won't even let you watch football, let alone watch it with you. But Lainey was different. She was real. This woman drove an absolutely gorgeous orange 1970 Chevelle SS with black racing stripes. She upgraded the car with disc brakes and modern wheels and tires for more control and better traction. Engine modifications allowed this beast to produce over 400 HP. This was a car not to be trifled with, and she handled it well. I knew it was time to take our relationship to the next level when she just stepped up to it. There were a couple of questions that obviously bothered her. Tim, don't you think it's time? She asked. She shook her hair at me and pouted her lips the way she knew how. It dawned on me. We don't need to rush anywhere, Lainey, I said. I think you're the only one, but we have all the time in the world to, well, you know. She laughed, looking at me. I've always been a little shy. Tim, I'm not talking about sex. We'll get to it this weekend, whether you like it or not. I don't look forward to it anymore. You've sent me home excited too many times, but that's not what I was talking about. I was still trying to get over my shock at her frank statement that I had sent her home excited. Things like this do wonders for the fragile male ego, but I was still wondering what the hell she was talking about. So I asked her, Well, honey, she said, You saw my car, rode in it, drove it. You even worked on my car. Don't you think it's time for me to see that famous Mustang of yours that I've heard so much about from everyone? My blood ran cold, and an ominous ringing rang in my ears. This could be the end of my relationship with Lainey, and I really liked her. But I knew it had to happen, one way or another. Okay, I said tremblingly. I'll wash it on Saturday afternoon as usual. Why don't you come over? We'll wash her, and then we'll go for a drive somewhere and maybe have dinner and a movie. And I plan to stay the night. Don't forget that, she grinned. I just nodded my head woodenly, because as much as I fantasized about sex with Lainey, I was damn sure we would never go that far. Saturday arrived, as it always does, and around one o'clock in the afternoon, Lainey showed up at my house. She had an overnight bag and a clothes carrier with her. She clearly had no idea what could happen. My eyes widened when I saw that she was wearing shorts and her t-shirt rode up above her waist, showing off a tiny piercing in her belly button 
on her surprisingly toned tummy. Her legs were covered with a golden tan and seemed endless. If you're so interested in my legs, why haven't you ever tried to get between them? She laughed, catching my gaze. I guess I wanted to enjoy the time we had and get to know you as much as I could during this time, I said. Why are you talking like we're going to break up or something, Tim? She asked. Did you know that I turned down dates with other guys in order to spend time with you? I really like you a lot, so you have nothing to worry about. She then kissed me, and I have to admit, I was a little nervous, kissing her in front of my house. I had kissed her many times before, so it wasn't about the kiss, and I didn't care at all whether my neighbors or friends saw us. The real danger was that she was getting close to me, so close to my house. My heart was beating so loudly that I was sure Elaine could hear it. A thin trickle of sweat ran down my spine from the horror of what might happen. This is Elaine, the one I call Laney. She's very sweet and loves cars, I said very loudly. Laney looked at me as if I was a little touched. I took her hand and led her into my house. She looked around and smiled all the time. It was very difficult for me not to smile. She immediately pulled me onto the sofa and pressed her lips to me again. We sat and kissed for about ten minutes, and my hands had already begun to roam over her body, when suddenly she jumped up like a jack-in-a-box. Okay, let's go look at this car before we started and have time to wash it or cook dinner, she said. Are you sure you want to see her now? I asked nervously. She nodded seriously. All I hear from everyone is about your car. Before I met you, whenever people found out I liked muscle cars, everyone in the building would say, you should see Tim's Mustang. I don't care that it's 80 years old and rusty. I love you. So if it's important to you and you like it, I'll like it too. Okay, I said, thinking that sooner or later this was bound to happen. The garage was attached, so we just walked out the door in the kitchen and into the garage. It was heated and had a beautiful striped floor that matched the car. I held Laney behind me as I walked to the garage, but she wouldn't let up. She jumped out of my shadow and examined the car. Oh my God, she's beautiful, she screamed, as if she had just seen a new supermodel. She began to try to walk around the car to inspect it from all sides, but I quickly grabbed her arm to prevent her from walking in front of or behind the car. Is there something wrong with the other side of the car? She asked me suspiciously. Chrissy, this is Elaine. I already told you about her. She is very sweet, and I have very strong feelings for her. I would be very upset if anything happened to her, I said loudly. Laney looked at me like I was a little out of my mind. I opened the garage door to let in some fresh air. Maybe I should take it back so we can wash it easier, Laney asked. I'll do so, I said. I noticed Elaine looking at me with amusement. So you love me, but you don't trust me with your car, she asked. Well, first you two should get to know each other better, I said. As I approached the car, I smiled again. It's funny that I've had the car for almost five years now, but I still smile every time I see it. 2006 Mustang GT with shaker hood and chrome Flowmaster dual exhaust. The car was flashy yellow with black racing stripes. I had custom chrome rod grills in high and low positions that matched each other. I installed a front chin spoiler to improve aerodynamics and provide additional cooling to the engine bay. Rear diffuser and rear blackout panels. The rotors are cross-drilled and slotted all around, and the very large calipers are painted yellow to match the body. Elaine was still shaking her head as I prepared to get into the car. When I approached the car, the door locks opened, the windows rolled down, and the engine started. Elaine didn't show it. She commented on the beauty of the exhaust the Flowmasters were giving me. I moved the car far enough out of the garage so we could wash it, but hey, open my side, she said. Chrissy, I hissed under my breath. I knew this was an important step. The passenger side door lock slowly moved and the window rolled down. Elaine looked at me, smiling. I noticed that you have an automatic starter, but it is controlled by voice, she asked. Well, something like that, I said. She tilted the front seat forward and began very carefully cleaning the leather on her side of the back seat while I did the same on mine. 
We used regular armor all on those surfaces in the back that weren't leather and vacuumed the carpet. As Elaine climbed out and prepared to start in the front, the passenger seat snapped into place. She smiled and gently patted the side of the car. I remembered with horror how that same seat snapped into place and nearly crushed a woman I had dated about two years earlier. She had to be hospitalized and still sees a chiropractor. I won't bore you with what goes into washing my car. But after two hours, we were done. Nothing terrible happened, and I began to relax a little. We went into the house and kissed a little before Elaine pulled away from me and said, Stop teasing me. At this rate, we'll never make it to dinner, and you're already trying to get your dessert. She kissed me again and went to the bathroom to change clothes. We'll take your car to the restaurant, she shouted through the door. I'll lead, she added after him. The sudden shock made me freeze in place. Elaine was alive and unharmed, but how much could Chrissy afford? She's quite difficult to deal with, I said. Relax, Daddy, I won't hurt your baby, she said, leaving the bathroom. I wasn't actually worried about her hurting Chrissy. I was worried about the opposite. But Elaine looked so good coming out of the bathroom in her little black dress that I just couldn't say no to her. I will be as gentle as if she were my own. Besides, we get along great anyway. I feel like we're old friends. She smiled at me when she said this, and I just looked in a nearby drawer and gave her the car keys. We locked the house and walked to the car hand in hand. I walked to the driver's side and the locks opened. Hey, I have the keys. How did you do it? Elaine asked, puzzled. Is this some kind of proximity sensor? Yeah, something like that, I said. I opened the door for her and she sat in the driver's seat and pressed herself against the soft leather. Holy shit, this seat feels like it's molding itself to my back, she said excitedly. This is very good, very convenient. It feels like I'm wearing a car rather than sitting in it. Yes, those are good seats, I said. She turned the ignition key, but nothing happened. Do you have a short circuit in the ignition system, she asked. Chrissy, I said. Let's. Don't scold her. Elaine said. Maybe I turned the key wrong. Let me try again. She simply reached for the key, and the powerful V8 started up and came to life. The whole machine vibrated with force. Elaine simply smiled, leaned towards me, and kissed me again. I like that sound, she said. I was in seventh heaven. I love Elaine, and it looks like Chrissy has accepted her. This in itself was a miracle. Chrissy had never even tolerated anyone before, let alone accepted him. We had a nice dinner and were on our way home when tragedy struck. Elaine looked at me and our eyes met. I think we got lost in the moment, and she took her eyes off the road for a moment, and before that happened, we were in trouble. Everything around began to move in slow motion. We had no way of avoiding the semi-trailer, and Elaine seemed frozen behind the wheel. The driver of the semi-trailer braked because he saw us before we saw him, but it was too late. Suddenly the steering wheel turned to the right, and my car spooned so sharply that it almost stood on two wheels. We missed the truck by millimeters, and no one was hurt. We stopped on the side of the road and watched further traffic. For the next few minutes our hearts were beating too fast. The only sound was the big V8 pulsing in the background. Elaine's eyes were as big as saucers. We should be dead, she said, and it would be my fault. I took my mind off the road. But we didn't die, I said. It wasn't even an accident. No harm done. Nothing bad, nothing bad. You are an excellent driver. You got us out of this situation and saved us all. That's the thing, Tim, she said, looking at me strangely. I didn't do a damn thing. I froze. The steering wheel just turned on its own. If it were up to my driving skills, we'd all be scattered on the road and wearing tags on our legs. It was very strange, as if the car... She looked at my face as if expecting me to say something to miss something, but all she heard was the rumbly of the big V8. She put the car in gear and drove us home. The rest of the way she didn't talk, didn't hold my hand, and didn't try to kiss me at all. When we pulled up to my house, she pulled into the garage, got out, and patted my car on the hood. Then, after thinking, she kissed her on the hood and said, Good night, and thank you. I closed the garage door and we went into the house. I felt that something had changed. I chalked it up to a near miss. I took off my jacket and tie and sat down on the sofa next to her. 
I knew in my heart that there would be no sex that night. Would you like a glass of wine or beer? I suggested. How about you tell me the truth? She said. I always tell you the truth, I said. I never lied to you about anything. There's a big difference between not lying and telling the truth, she told me. I could tell from the look in her eyes that she was up to something. I've been wondering all day why the hell you named your car after that stupid blonde from Company 3. But that's not entirely true, is it? Chrissy isn't named after Suzanne Summers, is she? This machine is not voice-controlled, is it? She asked, looking straight at me. I shrugged and shook my head. Chrissy is short for Christine, as in Stephen King's book, Christine, isn't it? I nodded my head. Elaine grabbed my hand and wrapped it around her. I could feel the goosebumps on her skin, and she was shivering in more ways than just the cool evening breeze. I took a blanket out of the closet, and we made ourselves comfortable on my couch. I'll tell you the whole story, I said. Five years ago, I got married. I thought, like most people, that I had a good marriage. Shana and I were together for about eight years. We both had great jobs and were quite happy. We didn't have children, but that was a blessing. We met in college, and I just couldn't figure us out. We weren't right for each other. I was a nerd, plain and simple. She was a cheerleader and the most beautiful girl on campus. So many guys were chasing her that you had to make an appointment to ask her out and only get rejected. It was a complete coincidence that we met at all. To say she was out of my league would be a gross understatement. If my league exploded, none of the fragments would reach it. She was the quintessential American beauty. Blonde hair, blue eyes, huge chest, long legs, the whole nine yards plus. Her roommate, Sarah, was in my honors English class, and we were working on a paper together. Sarah also did most of Shanna's English and history homework. Shanna had other people doing other things for her, so none of this tedious studying could interfere with her social life. Anyway, Sarah and I were working on our English assignments when Shanna came home from the beach with some guy. She threw off the covers as soon as she entered the dorm room and began to undress without even noticing my presence. Looking back, she probably did know I was there. She really enjoyed showing off her body. Her breasts were huge, not in the ugly porn star way, but large enough to look out of place on her small body. It was almost impossible to look anywhere else. Oh, sorry, she said, covering them, looking straight at me. I didn't expect Sarah to have guests. She never brings anyone home. I simply turned away from her and went back to studying with Sarah. The mood in the room somehow changed. Sarah spent a lot of time looking at me, as if she was trying to determine whether I still perceived her the same way after seeing the school princess almost naked. A few days later, Shanna called me. Her laptop wouldn't boot, and since she heard from Sarah that I was studying computer science, she was hoping I could help her. I told her that she would be better off taking the computer to the store where she bought it or to the computer science lab on campus. I then politely told her that I needed to get back to studying and hung up. The next day, Sarah came to my apartment with a large bag of cookies that she had baked. I didn't understand how or why, but suddenly, in her eyes, I became special. I think it had to do with the fact that I was the first person she had ever seen who refused Shana anything. In reality, I was more than a little intimidated by Shauna, but more than that, I just didn't see any possibility that she would ever pay attention to someone like me, like those guys who are into sports cars and dream of a Ferrari or Porsche. They know they will never be able to afford a car like this, so they buy cheap Japanese imports and add every possible part they can to it. They turn the car into the fastest and loudest Toyota Celica ever made, but deep down they know it's just not a Ferrari. More practical guys simply lower their expectations. I knew I would never have a chance with Shana, so Sarah was fine with me. Sarah was actually quite pretty. She was shy, slim, had nice legs and a sweet smile. But to be honest, there were hundreds of girls just like her all over campus. However, there was only one Shanna. Eventually, Sarah and I started dating and we started having sex. We even used their dorm room sometimes. And that's where the problem started. Sarah and I, like most bright young people, were something of an experimenter when it came to sex and other things. If we heard about something, we tried it. If one of us liked it, we added it to our repertoire. 
Sarah and Shanna talked to each other about different things as roommates, and I think our sex life was one of them. That first year, Shanna had sex with almost half the school. Poor Sarah only had me. Sarah was pretty open when it came to sex, and we walked out of her room one afternoon to find Shanna sitting on the couch when we walked out. I noticed that she was looking at me very funny, but I didn't attach any importance to it. The next day, I was leaving one of my classes and notice said Shanna, who, as usual, was talking to a group of guys at the other end of the hallway. As I passed by, she left her group and caught up with me. Hi, Tim, she said, smiling. Hello, I replied. Tim, what's wrong with me? She asked. I really didn't understand the question. I didn't know what the hell she was talking about, so I didn't say anything. Why don't you like me? She asked. You've never asked me out on a date and you don't even say anything to me other than hi and bye when you come over to have sex with my friend. So what's wrong with me? Shana, you're okay. We just don't know each other. We move in different circles. You're very popular and you have tons of guys trying to get a date with you. The football team and the basketball team, all the aspiring athletes and the rich guys, what chancy does someone like me have with someone like you? I said. Much more likely than you think, she began. All the guys you were talking about have one thing in common. They all have one aspect of their personality or some skill that gives them confidence. This boosts their ego to such an extent that they have the courage to achieve anything. That's why guys like that think they deserve me, or they want to be seen with me. I become just another achievement or another trophy. The guy I've been dating for the last three weeks, Butch Simpson, is the quarterback of our football team. We've been dating for three weeks now. I had sex with him and did all sorts of things to him that I'm afraid to admit. And only today, I found out that he doesn't even know what my last name is. Besides me, he has sexual relations with two more girls. I don't matter to him. I'm just a notch on his post. When I look at you and Sarah, I sometimes get jealous. And sometimes when I hear you in the room, I get very jealous because no one has ever done anything to me that would make me scream the way you make her. I talked to her about it, and I was just wondering why you chose her. Think about it sometime. Shana walked away, leaving me standing there with my mouth open. I was very flattered, but I didn't take it seriously. A few days later, one evening after her evening classes, Sarah was crossing campus and was hit by a reckless driver who did not slow down at all, her femur was shattered and both legs were badly broken. Some internal organs were also damaged. She was taken to the hospital and immediately after surgery, she was transferred to a hospital in her home state. I was waiting for her on the porch of her house, sitting on the big porch swing they have, when her mother came out to tell me the news. I got scared and cried like a child. Mrs. Dawson, their housekeeper, took me to the hospital, and I waited there almost all night, but I was not allowed to see her. She still did not regain consciousness. That day, my life changed dramatically. I could barely make it to most classes. The rest of the time, I walked around in a fog. Sarah and I, like most young people in love, considered ourselves invulnerable and did not think at all about what might happen. Her parents not only didn't know we were in love, they didn't even know I existed. I tried to see them and introduce myself before they took her, but in their own grief and suffering, they had no time for me. Like them, I had to face my grief alone. Surprisingly, Shana visited me several times and tried to cheer me up. She often brought me food and made me eat. A couple of times she took me on walks and let me talk about Sarah. She never spoke, just listened to me pour out my heart for another woman. When we returned to school after the Christmas holidays, there was no word about Sarah, and absorbed in my own education, over time I simply stopped asking. Shauna and I had entered the friendship stage. I figured she was just testing me out of loyalty to Sarah. One evening, she just showed up at my dorm while I was trying to study and dragged me to the movies. Almost every person in the cinema was wondering the same question as me. What the hell was Shauna Burnett doing with this nerd? Most of them didn't even know my name. Over the course of the evening, several of her ex-friends or ex-dates came over to talk to her, ignoring me as if I wasn't there. Of course, I didn't say anything. And when one of them sat down next to us and started trying to take her hand, I apologized and left. A couple of hours later, 
there was a knock on my door. I rolled over and tried to sleep, hoping she would just go away. The next moment I realized that she was standing in my room and looking at me, clenching her fists. My roommate let her in. Dude, do you even realize who this is? This is Shanna, he said, as if that explained everything. I don't think he knew what her last name was. Why the hell did you just leave? She shouted. She seemed to be on the verge of tears, which really confused me. Shana, there were three or four guys hanging around you, and every minute more were coming. You got all the attention you could handle. You didn't need me to interfere, I said. I appreciate everything you've done for me, and I will tell everyone who asks that there is another side to Shana. I will tell them how caring and caring you were and how you were there for me while I tried to get over what happened to Sarah. But in reality, you did much more than you would expect from a roommate. I looked at my roommate as I said this. He just grinned, shrugged, and said, Dude, she's Shauna. He also didn't indicate that he was going to leave so we could talk in private. It seemed like he was just staring at her from all sides. The earth is calling Tim, Shauna said hotly. Get your head out of your ass. Have you ever heard anyone talk about me and Mother Teresa in one paragraph, let alone one sentence? She looked at me as if I was one of the slow-witted ones. Tim, I'm damn sorry that this happened to Sarah. I had to find two more people to do my English and history homework. But that's not why I hung around you. Shanna, I don't do other people's homework, I said. Tim, have I ever asked you to do my homework? She snapped. She then turned to my roommate and found him with his head bowed, staring open-mouthed at her ass. Hey, asshole, she snapped. Since you're still here, have you ever heard me ask some guy to go on a date with me? Have you ever heard me practically beg some guy to do something to me? He shook his head, but didn't stop looking at her. Tim, I asked you to go to the cinema with me tonight, but not because I'm trying to help you forget, Sarah. I asked you because I wanted us to spend some time together. I just wanted it to be you and me, not you and me and Sarah's ghostly presence. I thought about it, but the idea seemed unrealistic. She must have had some kind of agenda or ulterior motive that I couldn't see through. Well, there wouldn't have been room for Sarah's ghost anyway, with all these guys that came, I said. And it's been two hours since I left, so you really couldn't be that worried about me leaving. I also noticed that she wasn't wearing the same clothes she was wearing when we first went to the movies. Tim, you can't blame me for these guys showing up. Some of them are friends and some I didn't even know, but you were the only one I was there with. I tried to tell some of them about it, and then the movie started, and I was so caught up in watching it, and when the movie ended, I looked back to ask you how you liked it, and you weren't there. That's why I came here to tell you that you left me, but really, I just want to know why you don't like me. She looked upset. It was as if there just wasn't a logical explanation for why anyone, especially a guy, wouldn't be that into her. Shana, what was the name of the movie we went to? I asked her. A blank expression appeared on her face. It was The Lord of the Rings, I said. This is part of a trilogy, I continued. Tonight was the first episode. The Fellowship of the Ring. The film is three hours long and had not yet started when I left a little over two hours ago. This means that the movie you watched to ask me how much I liked it is still playing right now but you had time not only to come here but also to change clothes and, judging by the smell, at least take a shower. I don't know what you want from me, but you should find another sucker. I grabbed one of my books from the table and walked out of the dorm, still wearing the sweatpants and T-shirt I usually slept in. I didn't even take the time to put on my socks and shoes. I went down the stairs to the building's furnace room and began reading the chapter assigned for the next week. When I finally got back to the dorm, my roommate was waiting for me. Dude, eh? why were you so rude to Shanna? He asked incredulously. She asked me to tell you that you won't get rid of her that easily. A couple of days later, I was in the library, and Emma Bailey, my classmate, came and sat at my table. She smiled shyly at me and looked at her book. As we sat there, she kept sneaking glances at me. And eventually, I just asked her what was going on. I'm just curious, she replied. You're just not like them. On whom? I asked. Didn't you meet Shauna Baker that night? I nodded my head. 
Well, it was the same night that she had her infamous group sex with four or five guys, so I'm just wondering what kind of group sex it is and what it's like. I have so many questions that I would love to ask you. I mean, I'm sure the woman is doing very well, and it seems like it's Shanna's signature anyway to be the center of attention, and one guy probably isn't enough for her anyway. But from the guy's point of view, you were just trying to have fun at any cost, or didn't it seem strange to you that your equipment was so close to so many other guys? I've often wondered if guys who do these things are a little gay. What about the girl? She must be the biggest slut imaginable. Either that is true, or she is so insensitive that she needs to reach a moronic level of sensation to even feel anything. It's really pathetic how much attention some people need. You're just not like them. What would Sarah think? She looked at me as if she really expected an answer. Before I could say anything, her expression changed. She suddenly turned pale, and then began to pack her things and hurried away, leaving her notebook behind. I was wondering why she left so quickly, and then I heard the click of expensive heels, and Shanna sat down opposite me. I quickly collected my things and also got ready to leave. I can't believe that fat bitch had the nerve to talk to my boyfriend in the public library where everyone could see her, Shana said. I hope she enjoys the choice she left herself. What are you talking about, Shana? I asked. Well, now she's limited herself to one of the two L's. She can choose loneliness or lesbianism because no guy on this campus will date her. I declared that I simply would not date any guy who had dated any girl who tried to date you so she will have to either satisfy herself in her room or have sex with girls. It will do her good, Tim. Everyone knows that you are mine. I got up from the table and left. The next morning, I came to history class very early. Professor Martin moved a few students around and we sat down for the lecture. I was sure he had changed the seating arrangement because he suspected several people of cheating. One of them was the guy who usually sat behind me. The seat behind me was now empty, and the girl who was sitting next to me had been replaced by a guy from India. About 20 minutes into the lecture, the door opened, and Shana walked into the room. She didn't even have any damn books or notebooks. She just came in and sat behind me. The professor didn't say a word. He paused for a second and then simply continued lecturing. He was usually a stickler for classroom rules and protocols. There was no talking allowed in his class unless it was part of a group discussion or assignment. Somehow, Shana was blowing on my neck and putting her fingers on my shoulder, even though I was sitting in the front row right in front of him. Shana left the class about ten minutes before it ended, and again the professor didn't bat an eyelid. I collected my books and walked out with the other students as soon as he dismissed us, wondering what was going on. I should have known she would be waiting outside for me. Hey, Tim, how about lunch? she asked. Haven't you already attended this class? I asked. Yes, Sarah did my homework. I still have her notes if you need them. I got an A, she said. Pure curiosity made me ask her, how did you pass the tests? I just returned them empty, she said. Professor Martin will do whatever I ask, and all I have to do is pet him. Tim, you have to come to terms with this. You won't be able to leave me unless you change schools. And we're too far into the semester for that to be practical. I know our first date didn't go very well, but I'd like to have a chance to explain a few things to you. Let me come to your dorm tonight and we can talk. After this, if you want, I will not come to your history lesson or to any of your classes unless you want me to. So, if I listen to you tonight, you promise you'll leave me alone? I asked. Tim, I never said that. I just said I won't come to any of your classes. She smiled. I will never leave you alone. That evening, Shauna came over and we went out and bought pizza and brought it to my dorm. Every guy in my building was excited when we headed to my room. I watched Shauna and noticed that she liked the attention. Her hips seemed to sway a little more. She bent down a little lower and revealed a little more cleavage in response to the gaze. It was like a performance. When we were alone in my room, it seemed much more peaceful. I began to wonder which one was the real Shauna. Tim, all I want is for you to give us a try. If things don't work out, I'll leave you alone, she said. Shauna, 
Every guy we come across would give their left nut to try with you. I'm not big or athletic. I'm not rich or handsome. Why can't you just find someone else? I asked. I can, she said. But I want you, Tim. Since the first time I saw you, I wanted you. Even when you were dating Sarah, I wanted you. And now that Sarah is gone, it's time for us. Can I think about it for a couple of days? I asked. If you waited so long, then a couple of days won't change anything, right? The next day I was talking with my friend Mark, who was preparing to graduate with a degree in psychology. This hoe is crazy, Mark told me. Speaking purely as a medical worker, this bitch is missing two sandwiches for a picnic. The only thing you have is time. Just play along with her, do whatever she wants. In a couple of weeks, she will get tired of you and she will leave you. This is her pattern. She only stays with a guy for a week or two. Then she moves on to the next one. Use this to your advantage. Get all the freebies and perks you can because everyone here either wants sex with her or wants sex with her again. Even women want to be on good terms with her, he said. But how do you know all this? I asked, thinking he was going to say that she was like some particular example he was researching or that she was the ideal archetype of a narcissist. I had sex with her, he said. I only lasted a day before she left me for some football player, but it was a great day. Her breasts are incredible. Enjoy it while you can. But why can't she just cross me off the list and move on? I whined. Because, asshole, he said sharply. You are the one who escaped. You are Moby Dick. It's like if Shauna was a rare car collector, she had every type of Mustang except the Eleanor. And you were the Eleanor. You're the only guy on campus who's ever said no to her. Remember how she showed you her breasts and you just turned away and went back to studying with your boring friend Sarah? Then she calls you and asks you to come fix her computer, and not only do you refuse, but you start dating Sarah. Then you started having sex with Sarah in Shanna's dorm. She should add you to her collection. But once she gets you, you'll be just like all the other guys. And since we're already talking about the Eleanor Mustang, you'll be gone in 60 seconds. Believe me, the sooner you give up, the sooner it will all be over. That's how I started dating Shanna. Within one day, the news spread throughout the entire campus. Girls who had never looked twice at me were now looking at me, trying to figure out why Shanna wanted me. Guys tried to be my friend or looked at me like they knew they were stronger, faster, or just better than me. And Shanna has completely changed. Almost overnight, she literally became the perfect girlfriend. She constantly came to me, brought food, and cleaned my room. When we went for a walk, not a single guy came closer than three meters to us. She always waited until I graduated so she could start kissing me. The first time we had sex was strange for me. Shauna wasn't very good in bed. She wasn't nearly as good as Sarah. Shauna had come to terms with the fact that she truly had an incredible body, and every guy she encountered wanted to take advantage of it. Our first round found me slightly disappointed that the campus sex goddess was just laying there like a beautiful stone. However, the second time, I used a few of my tricks. I didn't realize at the time that Shauna had probably had sex with 50 or 60 guys, but this was her first climax that wasn't manual. I didn't realize it either, but I was working against myself. Remember, my goal was just to play along with her until she dumped me and I could go back to my normal routine. For the first few weeks, I pretended that I really wanted to be with her, but I didn't have sex with her. I did all kinds of things for her. I bought her cards and constantly surprised her with all sorts of little things. I think at first I did it because that's who I was. She saw that I did this to Sarah, and I needed her to think that I had the same feelings for her that I had for Sarah. The problem was that no one had ever treated her this way before. All the athletes and rich guys she usually dated wanted to date her because of their looks, reputation, or athletic skills. Once they started dating her, their ego usually took over and they treated her like property or a trophy. Shauna started to really like the way I treated her before we had sex. As soon as we started having sex, she was hooked. Although I didn't know it, I had a better chance of becoming an opera singer than getting rid of Shauna. First, I started telling guys when Shauna and I would be dating, so they could come and I could leave, like the first time. 
I was sure that Shana was still messing with me, and I encouraged it, although not openly. If Shana said she was going on a date with a group of her girlfriends, I was fine with it. I was just telling her to have a good time and hoping that one of her friends had a huge piece of equipment and would get her away from me. However, after a few days, I noticed that walks with my girlfriends began to subside. Then, when she returned from a trip with her girlfriends, she still came to me to have sex. Then the visits from girlfriends simply stopped. Shauna practically moved in with me, and a bunch of guys, including Butch, looked like they wanted to kick my ass. Finally, I turned to Mark for help again. Mark, more than a month has passed and she still hasn't left me. What the hell is going on? I asked. You're stupid, he laughed. You really need to understand that college is more than just studying and going to classes. You really don't know, do you? What don't I know? I asked again. Shauna is really in love with you. She walks around the school and tells everyone that she loves you and you belong to her forever. Didn't she tell you about this? Well, yes, I said, puzzled. But doesn't everyone say that about the person they're with? Dude, Shauna never said anything like that about anyone. I told you she's kind of sick, but she even stopped having sex with other guys. That's why there are at least five guys that I know of who want to kick your ass for taking those breasts from them, he said. I really don't see your problem here. The most stunningly beautiful woman we've ever seen is crazy about you. Everyone would have such problems. He saw that I was still confused and shook his head. What's the worst thing that could happen to you? In a few weeks, she will come to her senses and leave you. You wanted this from the very beginning, didn't you? But for now, you can enjoy the feeling of having the sexiest chick you know at your fingertips. And that's how it went. Throughout last year of college, we were inseparable. Shauna still flirted with some of her professors to get grades, but other than a little touching and teasing, she never cheated on me. She even warned me about the teachers she teased so I wouldn't get the wrong idea. Five months before we graduated from high school, or I graduated from high school because Shauna still didn't know what she wanted to do, she started talking about our life together after high school. She started slowly and gradually increased the pace. I think we need to start looking for an apartment before summer starts, she said. We don't want to compete with all the other people who are finishing school and having to look for housing and work at the same time. We'll end up paying more for less housing than if we close now. I didn't say anything at first because I was still in control of my feelings for her. I couldn't afford to get too carried away with her because I still expected her to leave me at any moment. Then we had our first argument. Shauna wanted to come home with me and meet my parents, but I called it a day. I just told her straight up that I didn't think it was a good idea. She burst into tears and for the first time in several weeks, left the dorm. Her dorm roommate had her boyfriend staying with her because Shauna hadn't been around for so long. All the guys who hated me before were now smiling at me. But on the other hand, everyone else was talking about what an ass I was. I was sure that Shauna would start cheating on me and we would break up. Surprisingly, she didn't. She skipped classes and stayed in the dorm crying. Even more surprising was the fact that I couldn't sleep either. Damn, I missed her. Eventually, I had to admit that I had feelings for her too. Love can be damn tricky sometimes. The next day, I was leaving the computer science building after a lecture, and then she appeared. She had dark circles under her eyes and just looked miserable. When she saw me, she ran away from me as fast as she could, I ran after her and grabbed her hand. Shana, you don't have classes in this building. Why are you here? I asked her softly. I just thought that if I looked at you one more time, it would make me feel better, she cried. Forgive me, I won't do it again. I wrapped my arms around her and squeezed her as hard as I could. I even grabbed two big handfuls of her ass and just pulled her towards me. She kissed me. She pressed herself even more into me. Damn! Someone shouted behind us. I looked around and noticed that everyone near us was looking at us. Anytime, anywhere, I'm yours, she said. Needless to say, my parents loved her, especially my father, of course. It took mom longer to come to her senses, but eventually she too fell under Shauna's spell. We got married before I finished school. We went through the same normal adjustment period that most young couples go through. Of course, there were a few differences. 
Normal couples don't have a problem with people staring open-mouthed at their wife when they go to the cinema or a restaurant, but we dealt with it. I found a great job almost immediately after graduating from university, and Shanna, after several years of staying at home, got a job serving customers at a restaurant chain. She was great at it. When an irritated customer came to her, he would usually take one look at her and forget about why the service or food bothered him in the first place. About four years into our marriage, we started trying to get pregnant. Our sex life has always been intense, but we started having sex with a purpose. But nothing seemed to work. Eventually, we started seeing different doctors and learned that Shauna would never be able to have children. The news did something to her and she seemed to change overnight. She began to dress much more revealingly. It was almost like my student years. She seemed to be going out of her way to get attention again. When I asked her about this, she avoided answering and started crying. I knew it was some sort of emotional breakdown caused by the discovery of her infertility, but I didn't really know how to help her. I turned to a therapist for advice on how to deal with this. He told me that, as I suspected, this was probably just Shauna's way of trying to feel more attractive and that she could still turn men on. This is because a woman's role and part of her sexual identity is that childbearing is a core part of a woman's biological function. Shauna, finding that she could not perform this function, felt somehow inferior to other women, so she needed to prove that she was at least as attractive in appearance in order to somehow compensate for her biological inability. It didn't make any sense to me, but I didn't want to say anything to her about it because by that time, I loved her so much that I was ready to do anything for her. Then came the moment that I initially hoped for, but then began to fear. About a year after I found out she couldn't have children, I caught Shanna doing this. Some guy she knew in college was having sex with her on our couch when I walked into the house. In typical cliché fashion, I came home early and found them. I watched for a minute or two and was puzzled. Shauna just lay there while some guy had her. He had the biggest smile on his face, but she could have been watching a rerun of an old TV show. Oh, baby, he hissed. I'm going to finish. Do you want me to come out? It doesn't matter, she answered weakly. Just hurry up, okay? Oh, yes, that matters, he said. Your little bitch husband won't be too happy if I knock you up. Get away from me, asshole, Shauna screamed. Tim is a much bigger man than you will ever be. I don't know why I'm even doing this to you. You can't even make me climax. Get out of my house and never come back. Then she just started crying while he gathered his clothes and ran out of the house. He couldn't get his truck out of the driveway without hitting my car, so he drove through my grass and left ruts in it. But the lawn was the least of my problems. I sat down next to her and she looked up at me, tears still streaming down her cheeks. Oh no, she screamed when she realized that I had been there for a long time. I'll just pack a few things and won't disturb you, I said. I was probably in a lot more pain than I expected. I never thought I would ever truly love her, but I do. I always thought that I was only holding on to her because I had no other options. I mean, who else but her could truly want me? She was much more beautiful than any other woman I had been intimate with, and she seemed to genuinely care about me. But it's time to leave and end this farce, once and for all. I left and spent the night in a cheap motel that I still don't remember. I only remember that there were walls and a small bed, and the night cost me 49.95. The next day, Shanna was waiting for me near my work. She was wearing jeans and a sweatshirt and was trying to be as unsexy as possible, but it wasn't working. This woman could look sexy in a bag made of matting. She had huge circles under her eyes and was still crying. Everyone in the building looked at me like I was dog shit when I walked past her and refused to talk to her. My boss told me to take the day off, go home and get things done, because Shauna sitting in the parking lot crying was bad for business. Actually, I think he just wanted to please her. This was another case where her magical breasts influenced some weak guy. I finally agreed to go home and listen to her side of the story before heading back to my shitty motel. As soon as I got there, she started by taking off all her clothes and pouncing on me. 
Fuck off, Shanna. We're here to talk, not have sex. So say what you want to say. I snapped. I love you, Tim. You're the only one who wants me. You are the only one who truly loves me. Every other man I've ever met doesn't want to know me or care about me. All they want is a chance to get to my chest. And once they do this, most of them become so scared that they cannot carry out their plans. The few who can act only think about just fucking with me, like I'm just a barrel with a hole. They don't think for a second about whether I'm enjoying it. Then they need to tell everyone that they fucked me. That's part of why I was so drawn to you. When I first came home and saw you with Sarah, you looked at me and then just turned to her like you barely even noticed me. I undressed in front of you, pretending I didn't know you were there. But I knew you were there. In fact, I was so turned on by the fact that you didn't react to me like other guys that I would have fucked you right there in front of Sarah. I called you a couple of days later to ask you to fix my laptop. I didn't even have a laptop. I was planning on borrowing one, but I ended up not needing it because you said no. No one had ever told me anything like this before. Then you and Sarah started dating, and I started getting jealous. When I first heard you having sex with her and her climaxing with you, I started to hate my dorm roommate. Shauna bit her lip as if deciding what to say next. Later I found out what she was hiding at that time. I couldn't believe it, Shauna told me. I was the sexiest girl in school, and I was jealous of some simpleton from the dorm. All the big guys on campus were following me around. They were willing to do anything I said just to get the chance to be with me, and I was pining for some nerd. So, after Sarah's accident, I went after you. It took me a while because you were so damn stubborn. But in the end, I succeeded, and then I got you into bed, and it was better than I ever could have imagined. Even today I find myself craving what you do to me. Then, when you stopped wearing those thick glasses and let me dress you, I started to realize that you weren't bad-looking at all. And I just fell in love with you, Tim. Indeed, there is no other man with whom I would like to be together, and certainly no one I would love, except you. But when I found out I couldn't have children, I started to feel empty. It's like there's emptiness inside me. I analyze my life and realize that besides you, I have nothing. In the old days, I could lift my little finger and twenty guys would fight for the honor of doing something for me. But you were never someone I could control, and I began to doubt whether I could ever find another man. I doubted it because if I can't have children, why would any man need me? I am a biological dead end. I will never get pregnant. I literally have no purpose as a woman, I'm just a fuck toy and nothing more. But then, when that bastard started talking about you, I realized that, no matter what, I love you and you love me. So, maybe this is my purpose. Maybe my purpose is to make you happy. It was a great speech, and I thought about it for a long time. That night I spent the night at home, but slept in the guest room. It was several weeks before we were able to return to any intimacy, and it took months before I could say I loved her or even begin to feel it. But the balance of power in our relations has changed even more. And now, a few years later, all the stars lined up again. Shauna ran into Butch, the quarterback from our old college football team. Life was not kind to Butch. He was married to a short, fat woman with a mustache. She became pregnant by him, and he had no choice since her father was the chief of police. At first, Shauna was shocked by his appearance. Butch was fat, out of shape, and bald. At first, Butch had to blackmail her into getting into her pants. But once he got in, even though the sex wasn't good for Shauna, she enjoyed having control over him more than anything else. During the first few months of their affair, I started to suspect something again, but without proof, I didn't know what to do. Shauna started to pull away, and I didn't know how to deal with it. I knew it had something to do with Shauna's feelings of inadequacy again, and I didn't want to push her into it. Since she was my wife, I believed it was at least partly my fault. At the same time, I was evaluating my life. The years have been kind to me. I realized that I looked decent and could, if I wanted, find someone else for myself. So I decided to make myself even more attractive in hopes of getting my Shauna back. Instead of just sitting there and watching some stronger guy take my toys, I was going to fight back. I bought myself new clothes and got a new haircut. I started going to the gym and taking karate lessons. I even bought something I had dreamed of all my life. 
I bought a brand new Mustang GT. From the first day I bought the car, I knew something had changed in it. The strangest thing happened at a car dealership. The salesman could not find the keys to allow me to test drive or drive the car. He tried to open the door, but it was locked. All I did was try the door handle, and it opened immediately. He said he would go to his office and find the keys so I could drive. When he returned, I told him that I would take it, even though I didn't drive the car. I know it sounds stupid, but somehow I knew that this car and I were made for each other. He was also very happy. Mustangs don't stay parked for long. He couldn't sell this one because bright yellow paint isn't to everyone's taste, and there was just something about this car. The first day I drove this car home, I found out that Shauna was having sex with Butch. I saw him slip away as I pulled into my driveway. Shauna tried to pretend nothing was happening, but I knew, and I knew that she knew that I knew. A couple of weeks later, things got even weirder. I came home from work early and parked my Mustang in the garage. When I walked into the house, Butch was sitting in my living room, on my couch. Hi, Timmy, he said. We need to talk. Who are you? I asked. Well, except probably that you are the guy Shauna has sex with, and why should I talk to you? You will not recognize me? He asked in confusion. I'm Butch, from school. I was a protector. You stole Shauna from me. Oh yes, and what happened to you? I asked. Well, I wasn't good enough to become a professional and I got a girl pregnant. In any case, none of this matters. What's important is that I will have sex with Shauna whenever I want, and you won't be able to say or do anything about it. He stood up, leaned towards me and said, Otherwise, like I should have been scared. The moment the word otherwise came out of his mouth, I remembered what my karate instructor had told me. Land the decisive blow first, and the battle will be much easier. I need Butch in the groin with such force uh, that I brought him to his feet. Then, while he was jumping on his tiptoes, lousing his balance, I kick at him in the chest and knock at him down. As he lay on his back, I put my knee on his throat and looked down at him. I saw fear in his eyes. Listen, bitch, or butch, whatever your name is. I don't care. You can take Shauna out of here, right now. I won't lift a finger to stop you. Moreover, I will help her get ready. You're not the first person she's cheated on me with. I'm done with her. She's yours. Take her. She won't come with me, and I already have a wife, he whined. She loves you and will not leave you. I had to blackmail her to get her to fuck me. He was still holding his groin when I let him stand up. Get out of my house, Butch, I snapped. I'll be back, he shouted, still holding his genitals. Shauna better call me or we're both going to jail for a long time. I hate my life, so I don't mind going to jail to get away from this bitch I married. But I don't think being locked up in a women's prison will do your beautiful wife any good. As soon as he was outside the door, his courage returned. Next time I'll kick your ass, he grinned running to his car. He was limping from pain. A few minutes later, I walked out to my garage and was installing the rear blackout panel on my new Mustang when Shauna pulled up and walked into the garage. Where is Butch? She asked uncertainty. I kicked his ass and sent him home, I said without looking up from the car. Shauna, I'm not going through this again. Pack your things and leave. You can live with Butch, his wife and child, but I'm not going to put up with this. Didn't that asshole explain everything to you? She asked, already crying. It's not like last time. I'm not doing this out of curiosity or frustration. Tim, I know you love me. And believe it or not, I love you and only you. But I have no choice. My back is pressed against the wall. So until I find a way out, I'll just have to deal with it. Shana. What kind of power does Butch have over you that you're willing to give up our marriage for him? Now, I was really curious. Shana looked at the ground and couldn't meet my gaze. What exactly are you doing with the car? She asked. Can I sit in it? Maybe we could go for a ride? I had almost forgotten that she was trying to change the subject when she put her hand on the door handle and the locks clicked shut. I thought maybe I had touched a wire or something and shorted out the electronic locks. 
Shauna, what is Butch holding over your head? He said that if this gets out, you will both get jail time. He doesn't mind going to jail. He claims that he hates his wife and wants to leave her. What could be so bad? Did you sell drugs in college or something? It was so long ago that no one cares about it now. Tim, she said quietly. If I thought that you would wait for me, I would go to jail too. But the thing is, I'm more worried about you finding out than about me getting locked up. Shana, if you can't tell me, then I don't think our marriage can survive. I'll file for divorce as soon as I find a lawyer. You can take the house and car. I'll take my car and find a new place to live. I think you and Butch can use our house as your love nest, away from his wife. She ran into the house and slammed the door. I heard her screaming and crying from the garage. I decided to take my car for a drive to decide what to do. I really loved her. Then I noticed that the doors were locked and the keys were still in the ignition. Suddenly, it dawned on me that I was in trouble because I didn't have a spare set of keys. You'll have to call a locksmith. I got up and looked out the window. They were there. But something strange happened. The door lock simply opened. What was even stranger was that the engine started and the headlights came on. I remember thinking, it's just a short circuit in the wiring harness. My car will not be able to transform. I got into the car and reversed out of the garage. Shanna ran out of the house. Please don't leave me, she cried. The door locks clicked shut again as she approached the car. I started to think that maybe the car has a proximity sensor and it is connected to the alarm and auto starter. But the car did not have an automatic starter and the factory alarm system did not have any proximity sensors. Tim, please give me a couple of days to figure this out. I just need to explain all this to you somehow, she said. I rolled down the window and looked at her. She truly was beautiful, and I truly loved her with all my heart. You have two days, Shana, I said coldly. For two days, everything is on standby. You don't have sex or have any contact with Butch. You will sleep in the guest room. I don't hire a lawyer. After that, if we don't talk, I'll assume that you just can't give up Butch or that you're keeping a secret from me that you're willing to share with Butch, which means you and him should be married and I should be free. Where are you going now? She asked. Just for a ride, I said. Can I go? She asked quietly. Before I could say anything, the window closed on its own, the engine roared to life, and the car began to back up the driveway. I tried to tell her that it wasn't me, that there was a short circuit in the car's electronic system, but she turned away and walked back into the house looking like her life was about to end. I hate this bitch, I said loudly to no one as I drove along the deserted roads. I gave her a wonderful life, everything she ever asked for. I love her with all my heart and soul. How did she repay me? She cheats on me every chance she gets. Maybe she's just not the kind of woman who can be faithful, at least not to me. But she's so beautiful. It just breaks my heart every time she does that. But this time it's just amazing. Does she really think I'm going to believe this bullshit about Butch blackmailing her? I think they're together, and she just wants to be able to have sex with Butch without having to prevaricate. She just wants to rub my face in her shit because she knows she can't control me. I guess I thought I was only talking to myself and no one was listening to me. I often spoke my thoughts out loud to relieve stress and not get tense in bad situations. If I knew then what I know now, I would never have done this. After two days, Shanna came to me and said that she wanted the three of us to sit down and discuss the problem like adults. She suggested a possible solution. Her solution included two steps if I was ready. The first step involved meeting with Butch and trying to figure out if we could pay Butch some money to just go away. If he doesn't accept the money, will I be ready to just pack my things and leave with her? The second thing is she wanted us to go to marriage counseling because she really loves me with all her heart and doesn't want to lose me for anything. Maybe through counseling she can figure out what's wrong with her and why she keeps getting into these situations. She seemed so sincere, and she had been so miserable the last two days. So I agreed. A little later, Butch appeared. When he appeared, I just felt a sinking feeling in my stomach. He didn't move tentatively, as if he was afraid I'd kick his ass again. He grinned and grinned as if he had already won. 
Shauna started the conversation. Butch, you don't make very much money from your job. Instead of having sex with me, could we pay you some money? We could spend ten or fifteen thousand dollars to keep it a secret. Bitch, are you crazy or do you think I am? He grinned. What would I do with the money? My wife would find it and force me to spend it on things for her and the baby. I couldn't keep it in a jar because she would find out. And then how? Would I explain it? I already told you what I want. You used to like it too, until you started having sex with that weakling and let him take you away from me. So now, you're mine again. I'll have you as often as I want, unless your hubby wants to see some 300-pound prisoner turn you into a lesbian against your will. She said she doesn't want you, Butch, I muttered. That's even better, he snapped back. Throughout college, until you got your hands on her, I had to share this bitch with half the team. She was in control. When we had sex and how it was always up to her. She loved power and control more than anything else. You know, I once saw her having a gangbang with five guys, and she still hasn't reached peak. Just think. Five guys and all she wanted to do was go home, take a shower, and find out why some nerd dumped her at the movies. As the conversation continued, I became more and more angry. So maybe you need to know what's going on here. If we go to jail, you'll never see that bitch again. We'll most likely end up with a life sentence. Murder is still a capital offense and there is no statute of limitations. Shauna turned pale when he mentioned murder. Okay, I'll give you the opportunity to fuck me, she said. No, you won't. I'll kill him first, I said seriously. Your little wife obviously didn't tell you about this, did she? He asked. Okay, then it's my job. He seemed to really enjoy himself. Maybe he just liked it ruining other people's lives because his life had been so shitty ever since he dropped out of college. Please don't, Shanna wend. She looked so pathetic that my heart simply broke with pity for her. Whatever it is, we can handle it, I told her. When we were in college, Shanna could always wag her ass and every guy on campus would do whatever she wanted, he began. She also manipulated women through men because all she had to do was find out which guy the girl was interested in and go after him. None of the girls wanted to try to compete with her. Everything Shauna wanted, Shauna got, until you came along. For some reason I could never understand she was crazy about you. She told me a year before we left school that she was going to marry you. Only two things stood in the way. The first is that you didn't even look at her. I couldn't understand why. I thought maybe you were gay. Why didn't you like her? he asked. It's not that I didn't like her, I said. I just never thought that a girl like her would give me a chance to even kiss her ass, let alone date me. So I targeted girls who I thought would actually give me a chance. There is no point in pursuing something that you have no chance of getting. The second thing standing between you two was Shanna's little roommate. I can't even remember the name of this crap. But Shanna actually asked her to give you up. Shanna wanted her to leave you, she even asked her out on dates with any guy on campus she named. But that little bitch said you meant more to her than anything Shauna could offer. Then he smiled like a shark and then looked at me. So Shauna convinced one of the professors to lend her his car. She gave me the keys and promised to have sex with me every night for two weeks to drive the little bitch crazy. I was just going to hit her. Hard enough to break her leg or something so she had to go home. But I really couldn't control this car. As you remember, she ended up getting very badly hurt. She was taken home, but six months later she died without ever waking up from her coma. I'm not proud of what I did. I was so hooked on steroids back then that I made a lot of bad decisions. With too much testosterone in my body, I was angry and ready to fight one second and desperate for a woman the next. So I was really out of control. I'm sure the judge will take this into account when he sentences me. But poor Shana was the inspiration. She was not under any influence. She was just a jealous bitch who wanted other people's toys and couldn't stand the thought of anyone telling her no. I looked at the two of them, Butch grinning and Shauna with her tear-stained face in her hands, and I knew he was telling the truth. All my pain and anguish, all my love for Sarah, came back in that moment. She was actually taken from me just when things were starting to look up. I looked back and in an instant I saw the life I could have lived with Sarah, seeing all the love and loyalty of a woman who truly loved me in a way that Shauna, with all her problems, 
may never be able to. I was really angry, but then Butch put the other shoe down. Did she tell you the worst? He grinned. I mean, admit it. You're a nice guy. Did old Shauna ever tell you why her roommate's parents treated you like crap and refused to see you or let you see her? I looked at Shanna, and all I could see was her crying and shaking her head. They found out that night in the hospital that Sarah, yes, that was her name. Sarah was pregnant with your puppy, dude. So not only have you lost your girlfriend, but also your only chance to have children. That's why old Shanna went crazy when she found out she couldn't have children, partly because she feels worthless and partly because of what she took from you and can never replace. I couldn't stand it anymore. I needed to go away to think. I'm leaving to work on my car, I snapped. You need to figure out what you want to do, weakling, he snapped. Shauna couldn't stop crying. I couldn't bring myself to look at them. Okay, I said. I'm going to the police. Let them sort it out. No, Shauna screamed. Tim, please let Butch and I talk about this. We can work it out. I went out to the garage. I was thinking about putting in a rear diffuser because it was supposed to be a very easy install. I think we were louder than we thought because as soon as the garage door opened, my neighbor Steve poked his head into the garage. The car looks good, he said. Why don't you do mine too, he laughed. Steve filmed me and the car. I don't know why, but some guys take a video camera and just go crazy with it. The door to the house opened and Butch came out. Yeah, the car looks good, weakling, he said. When can I drive? We're not quite finished inside, he continued. Your little wife will like it if you come back to the house so we can finish everything. Maybe there will be a way to work things out in the end, he said, looking at my car. Fuck you, Butch. I'm going to the police. They'll figure it out, I said. Butch reached into his pocket and pulled out a gun. He pointed it at me and told Steve to close the garage door. I tried to be polite to you, he chuckled. But I brought this in case you want to try your damn karate moves again. How are these classes going? Is it you and a bunch of 10 and 12-year-olds kicking the boards in their little pajamas? Aren't you ashamed? Do you really enjoy this? You tell me that, Butch. How did you feel when you left here last time? It must have been a few days before you could walk straight. I laughed. Butch got angry, just as I had hoped. I was hoping he'd head towards me so I'd have a better chance of getting to him without getting shot. The closer we were to each other, the less advantage his pistol had. However, neither Steve nor I were prepared for what happened. As he moved towards us, he passed in front of my car. Suddenly she jerked forward, trapping his legs between the front bumper and the concrete wall of the garage. It happened so quickly that he didn't even have time to scream. The car pulled back and he made an ah sound. He fell between the car and the wall, knelt down and turned so that he was facing the car. He looked at Steve and me with surprise and shock on his face. All the bones in his legs were crushed and he could no longer stand. The car rushed forward again and crushed him against the wall with its chest. Holy shit, Steve said. How did you do this? I didn't do it, I told him. I have no idea how this happened. I went into the house and called the police. While I was inside, I heard Shauna crying quietly from the bedroom. I guess I should have gone and told her that Butch wouldn't bother her anymore or demand sex, but I didn't. The police car arrived a little later. When they arrived, Butch was still pinned between the wall and the car. The detectives forced us to move the car to free the body. Butch was crushed. Strangely, the image of my Mustang emblem was imprinted into the skin of his chest. Shauna came out to see what was happening. She spoke to a police officer and he told her that it appeared to be an accident. But the circumstances were suspicious. Steve and I were questioned separately and our stories matched. They also found a gun and discovered that only Butch had touched it. The good thing is that Steve was able to film almost everything that happened on his video camera, including Butch threatening us with a gun and being crushed by the car. Shauna decided to spend the next few days with her parents. She has already packed her suitcase. She kissed me. In a few days, when it's all over, we'll go to a psychologist and return everything to normal, she whispered. 
I love you, Tim. I swear I have never loved anyone else and never will. I will be the best wife you can imagine. I will never hurt you again. I promise you that in time, you will forget about Sarah. She held up her bag as the police and Steve stared at her in admiration. She walked slowly down the driveway, her hips and breasts swaying gently. Just before she got to her car, it happened. One of the cops was sitting in my car, and it took off and rolled down the driveway. The car slammed Shanna between itself and her car. Unlike Butch, it was almost merciful. She didn't even notice how it happened. All the policemen ran up to her, along with Steve and me. I cried and screamed and tried to pull the cop who was sitting in my car out of it and beat the crap out of him. In the end, they had to hit me with a stun gun to calm me down. I simply could not look at the twisted female figure squeezed between two cars. Shanna's car was totaled, but my Mustang wasn't even scratched. It was an accident, sir, the chief of police told me a couple of days later. We have examined your car from top to bottom, and it will be returned to you today. There is nothing mechanical about the car, and one of my officers was inside the car. He claims he was on the brakes when the car crushed your wife, so maybe you should get your brakes fixed. We offer you our deepest condolences, but there is nothing more we can do. We can't bring her back. His words sounded so empty, so far-fetched. It was probably a politically correct decision, but it didn't make me feel any better. When I picked up the car later that day, it was on a flatbed tow truck. The guy told me he was very sorry, but they couldn't start the car. There's something very strange about this car, mate, he said. I asked him to unload it in front of my garage. At that moment, I wasn't sure if I even wanted to return the car. Almost immediately after the tow truck was out of sight, it started up. The first thing I noticed was that the car was several feet closer to me than where we had left it. I knew this because when we lowered her, she was only two feet from the garage door. I asked to put it there so I could try to put it in neutral and just push it in since it wouldn't start. She was now at least two meters from the garage. Okay, come on, I think it's my turn now, I shouted. In my grief for Shana, I think I just wanted it to be over. The car started moving towards me, and I just closed my eyes. I hoped it would be quick, like Shanna's death. I really didn't want to die like Butch, slowly, from two or three brutal blows. I remembered how he lost the ability to move after the first blow, but there was enough consciousness to just stand in horror and wait for everything to happen again. A few seconds later, I felt something almost gently touch my leg. The front of the car moved up and down, and I could even hear a slight rush of air as the shocks rapidly contracted and expanded. The headlights flickered, turning off and on. The car behaved like a huge puppy who wanted to go for a walk. I got into the car and the engine started immediately. I drove for about half an hour and I don't really remember where I went, but I do remember that it gave me the time I needed to get my thoughts in order. I knew why Butch died, and the truth is, as cold as it may seem, the world is a better place without him. Even his wife and their child would be better off without the poison of living with a man who never loved them. But Shanna's death seemed cruel and unnecessary. Then I realized that the machine did this to protect me. My relationship with Shanna was built on lies. All this time I was waiting for her to leave me or to find out that she cheated on me again. During the entire time we were married, I never felt comfortable with her. I never felt like she belonged to me. Even now, I could not imagine that we would grow old together. Towards the end of the trip, I realized that Shana, as beautiful as she was, was never good for me. Besides, now that I knew what she had deprived me of, Sarah and my child, I could never look at her again without thinking about them. Even today, I wonder who it would be. A girl or a boy? What would we call her or him? Would Sarah have blossomed physically like I did after high school? Or would she have declined like Butch? It wouldn't matter because I would still love her. The machine somehow knew before I did that Shauna had to leave. And in the end, maybe it was better for Shauna too. Because throughout her life, she was never happy. Her beauty brought her no satisfaction, only pain. She could never cope with old age and the loss of her physical beauty. She also did not cope well in situations where she was not the center of attention. Perhaps leaving at the height of her attractiveness was the kindest way. A 
few days later the city offered me a six-figure sum, and I, of course, agreed. The circumstances of both accidents still raise suspicions today, especially Shauna. Police want to believe the brakes failed and the car rolled out of the driveway. The problem for me with this theory is that my driveway slopes up from the house, so the car had to defy gravity while the engine was off for any of this to make sense. When you add all this to the other things I've seen her do, it's a pretty strange picture. A few years ago, there was an article in the newspapers about all this, I said to Lainey as she snuggled up to me. Steve came to talk about it about a week later and brought me a Stephen King film. I have never seen him. He didn't want to go into the garage. He's still afraid, even now, several years later. Christina, he told me, shaking his head. She saved us both. Christina, I said. Somehow this name just fits. For the last few years, she has been my best and, practically, only friend. The few times I even thought about dating, she kind of shooed them away. I don't think she liked anyone until you came along. Over the years, as we grew closer, we started calling each other by our first names. So now I just call her Chrissy. She seems to like it. I think she likes you, too. Five years later, we have been married for four years and have a two-year-old daughter. Whenever our daughter Krista can't sleep, she just runs into the garage and sits in Chrissy's back seat and snuggles up against her skin. Somehow, the engine noise and vibrations lull my daughter to sleep. She's used to being there, and that's how it should be, since she was conceived in that same tiny back seat. So, as you can see, I didn't lie. There was a strange car sitting in my driveway all this time, only it was mine. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story.